Well guys, I, I gotta say, I'm really excited to be here. I had a long drive in this morning all the way from the South Hill, it took about five minutes. And the first thing I noticed when I walked in, walking around, looking at the, the pastries, coming to try to figure out where, uh, where I check in, one of the gals was just talking on the side and she's like, what's up with all these Kingsmen that are walking around here? So she's talking to all you guys all dressed up and stuff like that, much better dressed up than we were back in the day. But uh, what I hope to do here today is talk about my Pike experience, uh, what, it, what it meant to me uh, from my college days and how that prepared me for my professional and personal life going, going forward. And I'm going to do it through a bunch of stories. And I'm going to focus those stories mainly on my uh, personal and professional careers because you guys have heard the stories. You guys are living those stories right now in, in the college life. So I'm not going to talk about when I was an active uh, Frankly, because I still want to try to run for the Supreme Court of the United States at some point in time. So if I tell those stories, it will totally knock me out of being able to run for the, you know, of course. Some chuckles. Come on, you guys can laugh a little bit at this stuff. But <laughs> what, I, what I want to do is I want to, I want to talk about these stories, and I want to talk about how it's impacted me. And I, I want to, I'll have a couple themes that I'll, I'll be talking along the way. I'll talk about being part of something bigger than yourself, talking about... <clears throat> you know, the lifelong friendships I formulated along the way through Pi Kappa Alpha, about having fun along the way, doing it all, about brothers being there for you even after you depart the fraternity uh, as an undergraduate, about how leadership matters, and also about a culture of excellence and, and what, what that means. And so I'll kind of hopefully relay this through some stories that hopefully you will find uh, a little bit different than uh, you've seen before. And I'll say that my Pike experience I don't think is, uh, is uh, unique in any fashion whatsoever. And what I mean by that is, you know, as an undergraduate, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into, but I was really glad that I got into Pi Cap Alpha and hanging out with a bunch of really good guys at the University of Washington at the time and enjoying that college experience with them, having some opportunities for leadership and, and formulating those friendships. And I think all of you are experiencing that, that here today. But I do think once I left the fraternity, I have a little bit of different of a background. JR gave a little bit of kind of rundown, but I'll step into uh, who I am and kind of where, where I come from. So without, uh, I'll go ahead and lead off with that. So who the hell is this old guy up, up here in front, in front of you guys? I'll start off what I think is most imp important to me is, uh, you know, my husband. That's my wife, Sarah, there on the left. She's uh, somehow imported some, uh, you know, a Cantonese lady. She's Canadian. She's a flight nurse here in Spokane, so she goes and picks up really sick kids and brings them back to the Spokane hospitals that you guys see up there on the South Hill. And uh, we have two girls, Molly and Maeve. You can see uh, we got Superwoman there as well as uh, Rapunzel. That, uh, those pictures were from Halloween up there. Uh, love being a dad. It's been the best part, best part of my, my life. Never would have thought of that when I was at your guys' age, but it really is. Uh, I, I also have up there brother and uncle. My sister uh, at, at the time uh, was uh, kind of recruited in Alpha Phi through Dan, Dan's wife, Dan Miller, back there in the corner. And she spared my Pike experience as well, too, so much so that she married one of my fraternity brothers. Education, doing the obligatory bio here. I love this photo there. I did a flyover of uh, Washington playing Oregon. The ducks stomped us at the, at, the, at the time frame. Is there some ducks back there? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't, too, wasn't too pleased about that one. But uh, graduated from the University of Washington with a mechanical engineering degree, and I know uh, uh, literally nothing about engineering or anything mechanical either at that point in time. So it was a, I only did that degree to get myself postured so I could go into the Navy to be a pilot. You had to have a technical degree. Uh, have a Master of Aero from Emory-Riddle, and uh, Dan's going to hate me for this one. Actually, he just walked out there. So... I flipped over to the dark side, being a University of Washington graduate, and now I'm a student of Washington State University. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this Apple Cup. It's going to be pretty interesting coming up. All right. Uh, in terms of my professional journey, some photos along the way, so, uh, so it's more than just words. Uh, I retired as a Navy commander. I was in command of the Black Aces, uh, VFA 41, uh, one of the oldest squadrons in the Navy. It was awesome uh, having the, that opportunity. And a lot of my stories will have planes in it, just so you guys, you guys know, so something a little different. Uh, did that, I retired after 20 years, and I then became the chief pilot for Icon Aircraft, which is uh, this little guy right there. 
pretty cool. It's a little seaplane, small plane, really fun to fly. It's been in the news quite a bit lately, and you guys will, uh, I'll, I'll talk about some stories with that. And right now, I'm the general manager, uh, if I spelled that right, that'd be good, uh, for uh, an aerial firefighting company. So there's uh, one of our RJ-85s that uh, drops all the red stuff. So I actually, I have four planes right now that are going down to California to fight those fires that you guys have probably seen on the news right now. So uh, it's awesome. And I'll talk a little bit about that, that team as well, too. So let me go back to the day. Dan Miller is up there somewhere. There he is. Uh, rush chair. There's me. You can kind of see it. Social chair. No big deal uh, at, the, at the time. Uh, I joined the house when we were in these three crappy houses. How many beta beta guys? I saw some of those guys. Do you guys remember? Yeah, look at it. Do you guys even, you guys even hear stories about those three houses anymore? Yeah. Uh, so I was originally, I originally joined the fraternity out of the dormitories. And I, I, I can't even remember the name of the dormitory. It's been, it's been so long. But, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into at the, at the time. I was rowing crew for the University of Washington. A couple guys at Beta Beta Chapter rowing crew as well, too. And they invited me to do a sorority mixer. And then attended the event. That's where I met my girlfriend at the time. It's now Dan's wife. <laughs> uh, and I was hooked. You know, I, you know, the dormitory, you know, I, I would say I, I didn't really enjoy it. Everyone just kind of went back to the rooms, just kind of did their own thing. Uh, and then here was an opportunity to join, the, at the time, three houses. Now a uh, now nice new house that you guys are in now. But, you know, you're, you're, with, you're now ex going to your college experience with a bunch of like-minded guys that had the same kind of uh, values, the same kind of, uh, <clears throat> you know, interests. And having that experience was, was huge. And I, I didn't realize at the time how much value Pi Kappa Alpha was for me in my personal professional careers laying on. Uh, you know, at the time it was hanging out with sorority girls and doing all that type of stuff that you guys, I trade places with you guys in a heartbeat, by the way, right now. But what, at the time you're learning all, you have all these leadership opportunities that you would not necessarily have otherwise if you were just in the dorms. You learn all these soft skills about dealing, uh, dealing living with other guys. And you're, you're being part of something bigger than yourself. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that more here later on. But I'm really glad I made that choice back in uh, uh, the fall of 92, eventually getting initiated in 93. OK, so this is what I did for 20 years. That's a F-18 Foxtrot. It's a two-seat Super Hornet. Um, I, would, I would tell you uh, at the time, when I, was, when I was young, initially flying these things, it was all about the plane. And flying the plane, it is really cool, it is really, it is really fun. But the more senior I got, I, I learned that it was about something bigger than just the plane. You know, flying planes like that, that picture there, uh, it's actually me, can't really see it, but that's me up front. I'm doing something around 650 knots or so, about 200 feet, I'll say it's 200 feet here publicly, because I'm on camera. Uh, and I'm in a ridge, and there's a photographer that's up on a ridge line that's taking a photo from the side of a ridge line down on the plane. So that's, that's how that, that photo uh, came to be. Loved it. It was a real awesome opportunity to do that, do that stuff. But for as much fun as that stuff was, um, there's a lot of uh, sheer terror moments that are interlaced in becoming a, a naval aviator or a fighter pilot as well, too. This is a shot off an aircraft carrier. That's another Super Hornet there. It's getting ready to take off an aircraft carrier deck. And I will tell you guys, it's probably the third most scariest thing I've ever had to do in my life. I'll try to do my best to describe it here. You're hanging out in the ready room, which is down on the deck below the flight deck. And I will tell you that being in a fighter squadron is, was just a, Jay and I were just talking about it, it literally is a continuation of being in a fraternity. Uh, you're with a bunch of other guys that are very like-minded, all focused on, <laughs> on doing bigger things. And you're hanging out in this regular room with the guys. You brief up for your mission. If it's nighttime, they're rolling a movie. They're having snacks. Everybody's hanging out. And then when it's your time to walk, because it's your takeoff time, you go to the paraloft. You put on your G-suit. You put on your harness, your survival vest, hoping to God you never have to actually use that stuff. And in this case, as you launch off into combat, they'll check you out with a 9mm uh, gun. And you've got you to get that thing all checked out. And I've never quite understood it, but they give you, they issue you two clips of 10 rounds. And I don't know why, it's a Geneva Convention law or something like that. You're flying this multi 
million dollar fighter plane with a lot of very large bombs on it. We carry about 600 rounds of 20 Mike Mike, but I can only carry 20 rounds in the 9 millimeter. I, you're screwed anyway if you've got shot down behind any lines. You know, those 20 rounds ain't going to go that, that, that far. But you, once you get dressed, you, got, you really got to get your game face on. Because you're in this, you know, nice, cozy, warm environment. You got all your stuff on, and you got to walk out to the, the flight deck. And as you got more senior, you learned to try to find the exit from below that was the closest possible to the plane itself. I, if I can describe it, it's like when you walk outside, you know, your eyes kind of go from seeing as bright as it is now to it's just pure darkness out there. And oh, by the way, there's planes taking off and landing. It's loud as heck. And the ocean is right there. So if you, you know, if you take a step too far, you're going to fall into the ocean. It's literally one of the scariest things. Uh, I can, I, I'm doing a poor job of explaining it, but it sucks. You've got to, got to get up there, find your plane, Everything's trying to kill you, and it's just it's a miserable, miserable experience. So for as much fun as all that other stuff was, there's a little pain that comes along with it. So eventually you find your plane, you climb up in the plane, you make your little nest, pre-flight your aircraft, get all your mission systems on, and then you, uh, they'll break you down, which means they take the chocks off, and you've got to taxi your aircraft with these guys here with the wands over there. And they'll taxi you out to the jet blast, or over the jet blast deflector, they'll pop up, and they'll put you onto the shuttle, and once you're ready to go, you're going to go flick your lights on. And that kind of tells them that you're, re you're ready to go. And so this is what it looks like out the front. So literally, once you flick your lights on, some random guy you don't even know sees the lights come on there, and his hands are up like this, and he pushes this button. And the next thing you know is you're underneath about 6 Gs, accelerating to 150 knots in like less than a half a second to go airborne. I still squeal like a little girl when that, that stuff happens. I mean, it's... You're like literally pushed back in your chair and you're hurling off into just utter pure darkness there because it turns out it's pretty dark out in the ocean. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I can't, it sucks. It, and you're, you're 60 feet above the water and all of a sudden you're, you're flying, right? You're going, off, you're going off to do things. And like, like I said, this is the third most scariest thing uh, I've ever had to do. Now, here's the second most scariest thing I've ever had to do is you get launched off this aircraft carrier, guess what? You gotta, you gotta come, back on, come back aboard at some point in time. So just to give some context, this is what it looks like coming back aboard an aircraft I, I'm sorry that the lights kind of are washing things out a little bit, guys, but there's the aircraft carrier there. There's a Hornet uh, HUD there. We can talk about symbology later on um, if you guys wanna catch me on the side. But basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to line these all up, land on the aircraft carrier, you're using that lens system there, and, and come back aboard. This is what it looks like at nighttime. Just kind of put it in perspective. Like I said, this is the second most scariest thing I ever do. You're trusting the fact that you've been trained well enough that you're not going to hit anything along the way because on the sides here, there's a bunch of planes parked. There's a bunch of planes parked over here. Um, at five miles, when you're coming in the aircraft carrier because you're kind of doing a straight line approaching it, all you see is just a couple lights just bobbing there in the ocean. That's all you see. At about three miles, you can start breaking out what's called the landing area right here. And that's only a couple hundred feet long. And you'll see the box kind of break out there. At three quarter mile, you can actually see what's called the optical landing system here. So the way this works is that light up top, that amber light, you're trying to get it lined up with the, the green lights right there. And that means that you're going to land the aircraft in the landing area to catch, catch a wire. That's the whole, the whole goal behind it. Because if you go too high, this is not me, by the way, because this guy's kind of screwing it up. He's way too high. So what he's going to do is he's going to miss the wires He's going to basically do a touch and go, and he's going to have to come back around and try to do it all again. So you work <laughs> really hard to get down there. And if you miss a wire, you're literally like, you're swearing in the cockpit. I'll, I'll try not to swear when I'm up here. I apologize in advance if I do. And then you got to go back and do it all again. So literally, that terrifying event, you've got to relive it again, and you've got no choice. It's like going to the dentist. You've got to, you've got to go back and make it happen. So you trust that they've given you the skills not to hit anything. You're, you're praying that you catch a wire, because if you don't catch a wire, like I said, you've got to go around. And remember that ready room I talked about where the guys are hanging out watching a movie? When your, your squadron has a plane coming down, they stop the movie, and they put you up on the big screen. And the guys watch you guys come down. And so you're just like, ah, oh, nice landing. Good job, Sully. But if you miss it, you bolters, what the technical term for it is, then guys get really glued in. And if you miss it again, because usually what typically happens, you miss once, you're probably going to miss it twice or three times, because usually you're having a bad night. 
and everyone's out there and you know it's happening. They're out there just laughing at you. Like the other squadrons will call into the red room and usually what happens is they'll play Guns N' Roses, Welcome to the Jungle or something like that, you know, to the red room. Because that's kind of the, you know, it's kind of like the rivalry that you guys see between different fraternities, the same between fighter squadrons. So I hate that. I had to do several hundred of those things, and uh, I'm glad I don't have to do them anymore. But that's, that's the second most fearful thing I've, I've ever had to do. So why, why, do, <laughs> why would I put myself through all this stuff, right? You guys can see the title out there. Because this is just part of being something bigger than yourself. And this is something I learned not in the U.S. Navy, but I learned in Pike Alpha Alpha. It's being something, I mean, look how many guys are here, right? You, Hopefully you get the sense of this is more than just being some, some kid that's in the dorm, you know, going through college. You, you join a fraternity for a reason. You've got a bunch of like-minded guys, and you're, you're focused on being something bigger than yourself. And that's what it's like in the U.S. Navy as well, too. So the thing I fear the most was failing the guys that I was out there to support. So why did I put myself through this? Well, it was my comrade-in-arms, the Marines, the soldiers that, that were out there in Afghanistan and Iraq, they were on the ground that's expecting me to be overhead with 500 pounds of ordnance plus that 20, uh, 20 millimeter cannon. So if they needed that, those weapons because they're in contact with the enemy, I was there. That's why you go through all that stuff. And that's the thing that I feared the most was letting those guys down, right? Not being there for my comrades, not being there for my, for my brothers. And so that's why I put myself through all that stuff. I still hate that stuff to, today. Land on the aircraft carrier in the daytime, totally different story. It's a heck of a lot of fun, but at nighttime, it's just never fun. So that's being part of something bigger than yourself. How many guys were born after 92 in here? Okay, so I feel like these slides at least are good because it will provide some context of what was going on at the, at the time. And keep in mind, Dan Miller, uh, he stepped out, he's older than me. But this is how 1992 started out. The Huskies absolutely crushed Michigan in the Rose Bowl on January 1st. Okay, absolutely crushed. National champions, no big deal. For football, not a bad way to start out. And then this happened. Drew Bledsoe, you son of a, that guy ruined my freshman year. Now all the Wazoo guys, where are you guys back over there, right? You guys are well familiar with Wazoo. For those of you that are not Wazoo graduates, this is the guy that Tom Brady replaced in the, uh, for, the, for the Patriots. But the Huskies went in to, uh, to Pullman a little snow happened, and uh, we got crushed by, by Wazoo, thereby not winning our second national championship back-to-back. -back. So that's why I got a little bit of hate against Drew Bledsoe. Um, at the time, you guys familiar with the term grunge at all? Oh, yeah. All right, all right, we're at, least, we're at least good there. That's what was going on in Seattle at the time. Pearl Jam 10 had just come out, Nirvana Nevermind, Mud Honey. You, you would go to the house parties and you would have bands that hadn't hit the radio yet, but two weeks later they were one-hit wonders in the local radio station and then on the national things. And they were playing your house. They were playing at the other fraternities as well too. It was an awesome, awesome time to go be in Seattle at that time when this, it was the height of the grunge season. You also, like we would go to the bars and Pearl Jam would be playing underneath pseudo names. They would come in, they would play a three or four song set under some fake random name because they liked the other local band that was there and they were trying to kind of prop it up. That's what it was like going back there. It was a heck of a lot of fun. Some iconic photos there, the Moore Theater there, there's Vetter jumping off there, you know, back in the mosh pit days. Uh, one of the strangest mo moments there, that's, uh, that's after Kurt Cobain killed himself. That was just a couple blocks down from where the house sits uh, now. But that, that was uh, when Courtney Love was up there giving a, she gave a really odd eulogy, but it's a pretty iconic photo from back in the day. Temple of the Dog, you guys familiar with the term Temple of the Dog at all? Man, that was, uh, that was, that was basically Pearl Jam, Mother Love Bone, Alice in Chains, and Soundgarden all came together to be one band for, for an album. There's only <laughs> one album out there, but that, that's what it was like back in, the, back in the day. Chris Cornell out there, right, over there, so you can see some. That's what, those guys, we used to see walking down the street, like in the university district, those guys would just be hanging out. So it was a pretty fun time to be at school. So while all this was going on there, so here's, uh, here's kind of my second theme there, the lifelong friendships that formulated a bunch of pictures back in the day. The reason why I went into the grunge is because see all the awesome flannel that's going on there. 
Um, see pictures, there's uh, Dan Miller up, up there. Uh, Brian Mann, if you guys are familiar with Brian Mann at all. My little brother, Nat Mucha, who's the president down there in the Lone Star State. These guys will laugh because they, they know those guys. So we, we had a great time at school. And, and these, this is where a bunch of friendships formulated that I still have to this day, kind of moving forward. Here's a bunch of those same guys uh, that you see in the previous pictures, but you know we're looking a lot older than, than, uh, than back, back in the day there. <coughs> this is the type of stuff that I think, it, for me personally, was probably the greatest value of being Pike Alpha Alpha, these, fr these friendships. I, can, I, I still remember the guys I went to high school with to some extent, but I don't keep in contact with any of those guys. Even at the University of Washington, unless they were in the Navy ROTC program and came uh, into naval aviation, I would have had some kind of uh, bond with. I still know those guys. But if they weren't in my fraternity, I don't remember hardly anybody at the University of Washington uh, at, at the time. But I remember my brothers, and I still hang out with the, uh, all these guys up there. So some recent, recent photos. Uh, and, and that's what I hope you guys find as well, too, eventually, from the guys that are sitting here in the room with you as well. All right, another story for you. Okay, this, this, uh, this, is, a, this is an F-18 Charlie. It's not, not a Super Hornet, it's a regular Hornet. But part of the mission at the time, the squadron that I was in, we would deploy from the west coast of California, and we'd fly all the way to Japan, and we did it in a cu couple legs. And I'll kind of talk about uh, how that bro broke down. So this guy up here, uh, his call sign is 11. I'm going to throw this out here, but I doubt it. Has anyone even heard of Spinal Tap? A couple guys have. You know, you turn it up to 11. This guy's inner voice was unbelievably loud. So his call sign was 11. Uh, great dude, bigger than life. The call sign was 11. He was really well liked within the squadron. Now, truth be told, I'm a bit of a prankster. Uh, and I, was, I wish I could take full credit for the story, which I'm, I'm going to bow ready to tell you about. But this is part of... What I think is the most important thing is when you're, even in the fraternity, we had a lot of fun there, but even in your professional life, I hope you can find some fun along the way. And part of that is just having good natured fun. Uh, and I'll, I'll, tell you about the, I'll tell you about how this one ends up. So we're on day two. We'd just flown from uh, basically California to Hawaii, spent a couple nights there, and we're getting ready to go fly from Hawaii to Guam. You guys, I'm sorry this screen isn't so good, but it's about 3,300 miles which are like in an F-18, what does that take, 15 minutes? I wish, but uh, it, it takes about eight hours when you're getting gas. It takes, it's a really long flight. Now you're in this cockpit, you've got a bag that you get to pack some snacks in, a couple Diet Cokes, whatever you, whatever you want, a couple piss bags in case you got to piss along the way, and you really got to plan out your lunch and your dinner the night before so you don't have to, you, uh, number two doesn't become your number one issue in the cockpit. <laughs> you know, in there, because you're trapped. I mean, there, there's no going anywhere in this, this thing. <laughs> so the way this thing works is you join up with six other F-18s. So there's six of us in total, and we get behind a KC-10 there. You can see there's two. I actually took these photos from that, the high quality. Uh, you're getting gas along the way, and it's an eight-hour flight. I mean, the thing is wicked long. So we took the liberty of stealing Matt 11 Lowe's helmet bag, where he's got all the snacks, the, the morning of, and we put a five pound dead fish in the bottom of his, his helmet bag. <laughs> so, <laughs> like I said, I wish I could take full credit for this one, but so we're three hours into this eight hour flight and we're dying because he hasn't found it yet. So we're just making up, just BS stuff. We're like, Hey, does anyone have this specific chart or something like that? And so finally, he digs down his helmet bag and finds this wet, nasty fish. So I'll go back to this photo here. There's Matt, and there's a fish right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nicer photo. The, the other photo is he's giving me the international symbol for uh, piss off, you know, basically. <laughs> so he's got five more hours. It ain't like you can roll down the window and throw it out. <laughs> so he's now trapped in that cockpit for the next couple hours. But you know what? He did it with a smile on his face the, the rest of the way. You can see it's kind of hard to see, but he's, got, he's grinning ear to ear because he knows he's, he's been played. And, you know, that's the value of having fun along the way. Good-natured fun, 
especially with teams like this. I mean, as a fighter pot, I mean, we were, you're so switched on all the time, you've got to break up the monotony at some point in time. But having good nature fun that builds teams and um, brings each other together, that stuff is super valuable. But I think you guys also know too, I mean, there's also the fun where you're picking, picking on guys and it goes a little bit too far. That's where it can actually break down teams as well too. So as long as you're having fun with a smile on your face and you're doing it good natured fun, that's, that's the way to do it. So you know, don't get trapped in an F-18 with a dead fish. That's all I can say. All right, um, just kind of a recap of how I got to, to hear uh, speaking in front of you, I think it was worth just a little bit of a side story. So self admittedly, I have not been the best alumni uh, per participating uh, in Pike Alpha. I wish I could go back and change that. I'm actually working on trying to be a little bit more part of the fraternity. But you know, part of that was being in the Navy, 20 years in the Navy, you're just gone a lot, everything. I just had other priorities. But looking back on it, I can tell you now that I, I wish I had been done doing more and I look forward to doing more here in the future. So how I got here today is I was aboard the aircraft carrier, there's, there's me up there, and, uh, and that's Justin Buck, who's the CEO of PICAP Alpha. He was on board the aircraft carrier for a VIP visit and it happened to be my squadron that was hosting the VIPs that day. And I'm like, oh, PICAP Alpha, that's pretty, pretty cool. So, we're in a room like this and everyone's going around and introduce themselves and he's like Justin Buck, CEO of Pi Cap Alpha and it comes around to me and I give him the challenge and, uh, and then you know, we, hit, we hit it off. Uh, I mean, we spent most of the rest of the time when he was on that trip just kind of talking about leadership and talking about um, you know, you know, leading 18 to 22 year old uh, men and women. Uh, we had a lot of the shame stories. We kind of really kind of st uh, struck it off. But I also was talking to him as well too is, you know, I was getting ready to retire out of the U.S. Navy at this, this time frame. Uh, you saw my family there. I had, uh, I had just one of them at the time. My wife was pregnant. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit, you know, you're a fighter pilot for 20 years. And on my resume, I mean, I can say pretty good at blowing shit up. I, sorry. I did it already. Sorry. I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. There's not a lot of really big job market out there in corporate America for blowing stuff up real good. You know, and I was kind of talking about this. How many of you guys are seniors right now in here? How many of you have got some trepidation about jump, jumping into the job market, job market or are a little bit concerned about that? Anybody? A couple of you guys, right? It's scary, right? I mean, you're, you're there right now. You're in the fraternity. You're, you're in school. It's what you know, right? You've been doing it for three, four, five years, six, some, some cases. <laughs> um, there's... <laughs> There's a, there's a little bit of fear there, and I, and I had that, and I was talking to Justin about that, and, uh, and I will tell you, you know, he was instantly there, there for me. So as soon as he got back and uh, this article uh, went up there, you know, he dialed me into the Greater Pi Cop Alpha Network. He's like, Shane, we got you, man. We're gonna, I'm going to try to help you find a job, find, find your next career. And it was amazing having been, um, you know, not particularly involved in the fraternity about how quickly I was welcomed back into the fold. And, and how your brothers are, th are there for you. Uh, and I will say it's, it's absolutely, I mean, it was awesome. And I, I can tell you it was so much stress that, that went off. Even though it didn't directly pan out to a job, it, it was just a sheer fact to know that you had a support network that was there for you. You had more resources beyond than, than you would have ever guessed. I mean, he had, he had me connecting to sitting congressmen. I mean, it was crazy. Uh, and just had, knowing that that there is was, was amazing. Uh, and also from this, he dialed me into uh, Brent Phillips Noise. Any of you guys familiar with him? He's the chief marketing officer at Pi Cap Alpha, who was also a former Navy veteran. And Noise and I had never met before, but the fact that we had this shared background of being a Pike, and also he was a naval aviator as well too, we, we instantly kind of formed that bond. And he was, he was also there for me to also help the transition as well too. So uh, I had never met Noise before. Uh, about a year later after we were talking on the phone, he was helping me out. He came up, he uh, was doing a uh, Pike University in Santa Clara and he came up and visited me while I was working at the uh, Icon. And there's a picture of us flying. Uh, not too much of a story there other than the fact that you know, your, your brothers are there for you. And it's really nice knowing that, that, the, that you have that network and they were there for you. Okay, so let me just transition. I'm gonna do my best to, uh, to not get emotional on this one just because this, this story kind of hits home. My point with this one is leadership matters. 
Let me just give you a hint in aviation. It is never ever good to have your photo up like this on a slide that I'm about ready to tell a story. Okay. Uh, it usually means usually one of two, two things and uh, it, you'll see what I mean here. So this is uh, John Carco. He was a colleague of mine at Icon Aircraft while I was a chief pilot. He is a, a brilliant guy. He's responsible for uh, designing 34 different aircraft including the Icon A5 which is uh, a plane you'll see here again in a second. And this is Charlie Seaver, new colleague, had only been on the job for a week. Hadn't even moved his family up, two small kids, wife. Hadn't even started the job. Uh, or he had just started the job that Monday, and this is like, this is like Wednesday uh, of the, what happens with this story. So John, having designed the plane, takes out Chari, and Chari is the director of engineering. So they're, they're married to formulate this partnership about how do we get this plane manufactured and out, out to the market. So John wants to take him on the plane, show him, show him the awesome plane, talk to him about it, show it to him firsthand so we can experience it. So they went flying out there at what's called uh, Lake Berryessa. You're probably familiar there, Michael. So this is Lake Berryessa, the bigger part of the lake. And uh, typically we go in there, we, we fly over this dam here uh, and we're <laughs> flying along this canyon. It's wider than it looks like here on the Google Earth. But John and Chari were flying up this canyon here, and I think my name's on the bottom of the National Transportation Safety Board uh, uh, investigation of what happened uh, here, and I'll show you the pictures of what happened. I think they just got into a conversation, and I think that conversation caused John to go straight up what's called Little Portuguese Canyon here instead of turning left and going to the bigger part of the lake. So this is what happened having gone, gone up the lake uh, in the wrong direction. I was sitting at my desk, I got a phone call from the Air Force because they, they manage the uh, satellite system that picks up the emergency locator transmitters. And those only go off when they have a high G-force hit, uh, typically what happens when a plane hits. Uh, so weren't able to reach them on the radio, I jumped in the plane, flew up there, I was the first person on the scene. Uh, and this is what I saw. Saw a couple uh, first responders that got up there and trying to coordinate some rescue efforts. The first responders uh, initially brought in an air ambulance helicopter, and while I was out there, they told the air ambulance helicopter just to go away. That only happens because they're fatality. So, you know, so here's two colleagues. It was under my watch. I commanded a fighter squadron in combat. I never lost anybody. I'm in this job for about six months, lost two colleagues, two colleagues right away. So my point with this is, this is when leadership really matters, right? It's not when things are easy, things are great, you're a Smythe chapter winner, things are going good. Leadership really matters when things are going right. So in this case, flew the plane back. As soon as I got, it, got out of the plane, you know, hit a lot of people. People knew that the emergency lo uh, locator transmitter was going off. And they could just see it on my face. And you could just see people in the company were just breaking down. I mean. They just lost two colleagues. Um, it, was, it was horrible. It's like one of, the, one of the most challenging professional days I've ever had. But that's, again, back to my point, that's when leadership really matters. Someone needed to step in and direct the company and direct the team to do the right things because there's a lot of other things that need to happen, contacting the, these uh, team members' families, doing all that type of stuff, consoling the grieving colleagues that you have, not, not fun, but someone needed to do it. And I, I think each of you guys will hopefully not have to face an experience like this, but you know, it doesn't need to be a big incident. And I'll, I'll show you a couple other photos here. You're gonna be like, wow, Shane, no wonder you're not at this company anymore. Um, this, this crash had happened right before that. That's also bad. Nobody got injured on this one. Uh, one of the guys had a mechanical failure. He was able to land the aircraft safely. Actually, no damage happened to the aircraft there. Anybody familiar with Roy Holiday, baseball player? You guys recognize that photo? That's Roy Holiday. So he was a client of ours. So Roy Holiday, um, the investigation's not out, but that was his crash. So I think the toxicology came out. He was on some amphetamines as well as he had a BAC as well too. So, you know, as bad as that other story was in this job, it kept getting worse, right? And my, my, my point with this is, you know, it doesn't have to be as bad or continue to get bad as this. You, 
in terms of leadership matters, you are, each and every single one of you are faced with those opportunities day by day, or even the small things where you have an opportunity to do the right thing, to not be a bystander, to step, step in, you know, grab that brother, put your arm around him. That, that's when leadership really matters, the day by day stuff. But if you get these big opportunities, be the first out there, be the first to step in, be the first to lead. That's the stuff I feel like Pi Cap Alpha set me up fairly well for was, I had a bunch of opportunities when I was in school, but future, my success in the Navy, I think was, uh, I think my success was really f as a foundation of what I learned there at Pi Cap Alpha. So, try to change it to something a little more positive, positive here. But I wanted to relay that stuff, because I remember in the beginning I said, I want to tell you guys stories about my successes and failures, and that's probably one of my biggest failures I, I, I had. So this is what I do now. I work uh, for a company called Aeroflight. I'm the general manager. We do aerial firefighting services, so we're out there fighting the campfire uh, right now down there in Chico. It burned through that town called Paradise. Burned over an entire town two days ago down there in California. Um, back to you know being part of something bigger than yourself. I think I really like this job because it's just like the military, just like I felt like in Pikes. I'm part of something bigger. We have a mission to defend people, defend property. Here's a picture of a CL-415, it's a water bomber. Obviously there's a bunch of water coming out there. Here's another RJ-85. Uh, and I love going to this, this job. Every single day I drive to work with a smile on my face. And I'm able to do that because I got really, really good people that work on this team. I look at my entire job as, my entire job is setting my team up for success. I remove barriers from them, I enable them, give them resources to do their job. And this is where, kind of dovetailing off the leadership thing, this is, this is what makes uh, this job so fun for me, is having these great people, a little humble brag here, but we just got voted one of the best places to work in the Inland North Northwest. It had nothing to do with me as the general manager. It had to do with people, like-minded, working together, looking out for one another, taking that time um, to train each other, to do things right. This is where, this is, this is where culture really, really matters. I'll tell you as a, as a leader, you're, the most important thing that I do as a leader is to drive culture. Not just any culture, but a positive culture. A culture that drives people to look out for one another, to set an environment where you can learn from one another, uh, a, an environment by which people can grow and mature and, and become better at what, what they do. That's the, important of, uh, that's the importance of culture. So I'm lucky to have a company that does so well at this, but this was back again, back to the days of Pi Cap Alpha, having a positive culture where we looked out for one another. That's, that's so important, because if you have a bad culture in your chapter, you have a bad culture in your company, things are not gonna go well. So when you've got that positive culture, your company, your chapter is going to be successful and if you've got a poor culture, it's gonna be exactly the opposite. So hopefully you guys, how many, how many of you guys feel like your chapter's got a good culture? Most of them, that's good. The thing I'll leave you with though is, good culture just doesn't happen overnight and, it, and it's not something you can rely upon or rely upon the fact that it's always gonna be there. I, I always give this analogy of good culture is like pushing a boulder up a hill. You always have to constantly be working at it, keep pushing, or that the moment that you give up on that boulder is gonna slide back down on you. Okay, and that's, that's where you can, you can lose that opportun opportunity to have good culture. So last small story here, and I'll just kinda open up for, for questions. This is uh, Spokane without snow, but uh, that was this summer. There's, uh, there's a fire there called the uh, Beacon Hill Fire. And um, really proud of my team there. There's a fire that was threatening a bunch of houses there. And again, having that good culture and a team that wants to be uh, bigger than something themselves, have, a, have the mission. There's a bunch of the planes there uh, defending Spokane proper. And that's that just is about a mile away from where we sit today. So again, I look at my job. It's awesome seeing my team in uh, out there kicking butt. I wish I could take credit for it, but I very much look at my job as like I'm the coach sitting on the sidelines and just love watching them go out there and just kick, kick butt. So tying it all together, there's all the themes I kind of I covered along the way. And I, I hope through my stories that uh, it was at least somewhat entertaining, but I would really would say that my success, both personally and professionally, really stems from my time there at Pi, Pi Cap Alpha. And so it's one of the best decisions I ever made. 
And again, I trade positions with you guys in a heartbeat to go back there and live that again. So enjoy it while you're, while you're an undergraduate. But just know that uh, you know, Pike, Pike is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a lifelong thing. Not only lifelong friends, but I you know, gave, uh, gave my story there about how Pike's kind of helped me out along the way too when I transitioned out of the Navy. Uh, I really enjoy the fact that I, I was a Pike and it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me guys. So what questions do you guys have for me?